Great. Well, uh, I'm excited to talk about my favorite topic, and I'm going to try to jazz it up for all of you because I know uh, heart failure management may not be your favorite topic. Some disclosures. So, um, you know, heart failure is a very serious disease, as we all know. Uh, many, many patients have heart failure. Uh, we all take care of them. And uh, a lot of them actually have advanced heart failure. About one in 10 patients with, with heart failure in our clinic actually have advanced heart failure. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that and what out, you know, outpatient management after a hospitalization, the implications for that. Um, for patients who are hospitalized, median survival is less than two and a half years and contributes to the overwhelming majority of the deaths you know, in our heart failure population. Despite all of the pharmacologic and device-based therapies, deaths are on the rise uh, for heart failure. And if we contextualize the risk of a patient with heart failure to a patient with ASCVD, we've heard a lot about coronary disease, and we know that these patients are at very, very high risk, but even our highest risk patient with ASCVD, somebody with multiple events, hospitalizations, um, NSTEMI, et cetera, doesn't even come close to our stable outpatient with heart failure, their risk. Um, so nobody with heart failure is stable. These people are all at extremely high risk of death. And if we look at our medical therapy for patients with heart failure and the impact, if we drill it down to number needed to treat, you know, um, when was the last time a, a patient le left a cardiology office who has coronary disease without an aspirin and a statin? Of course we offer it, it is beneficial, but the medications that we have uh, in our arsenal for heart failure are even more beneficial uh, for an even higher risk patient. So trying to, you know, really make sure that we drive home this message and that patients are offered medication is, uh, is my number one goal. So why are we losing the game? Why are so many people dying, more people dying? Well, I think we're under treating stage C heart failure uh, across the board. I know we are in, in um, you know, in my hospital system and in the state of Georgia and, and across the nation. We are not identifying stage D disease. Um, these people are being admitted to the hospital. We diurese them a little bit and send them on their way. And we also need improved technologies. Uh, well, I talked a little bit about this yesterday in the case presentation, and I think everybody here is aware that GDMT now um, encompasses the four pillars of heart failure uh, therapy, beta blockers, ACE, ARP, ARNI, MRAs, and SGLT2 inhibitors. And the goal is to rapidly or simultaneously initiate these drugs just all at once. Um, and this is the best practice. And then to continue to titrate rapidly in clinic so that patient can, can get the benefit of these medications within a few weeks, at least to a few months. And if we look at all of these drugs, the number needed to treat if they are utilized together is less than four. And if we compare conventional therapy, so just an ACE inhibitor and a beta blocker, uh, unfortunately, what a lot of patients and probably all of our practices are on to uh, comprehensive therapy, adding an MRA, switching to an ARNI, and adding an SGLT2 inhibitor, we can offer patients over six more years of life. Imagine if that was for breast cancer. It would be on nightly news. You know, there would be documentaries, commercials everywhere. Um, we just uh, haven't been doing a good job selling this. And we can also tell patients that they can feel better on these newer drugs. You know, the SGLT2 inhibitors and ARNI, there are data that patients actually feel better. The left atrial pressure drops, they decongest in a way that diuretics just really can't achieve, and they feel so much better. The timing of GDMP, GDMT is also important. We can see in all classes of drugs that the benefit in terms of mortality and hospitalizations is within the first month. So if the plan is to send the patient home and start medications in the next month or two, we've missed the boat and we've missed an opportunity to potentially save the patient's life. Now, if Greg Fonero were here, and I know, you know, he practices in California, um, you know, he could be here, but if he was, he would definitely want me to mention that uh, dosing is important as well, especially when it comes to beta blockers for non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. The higher dose the patient is on, the more likely they are to have um, a longer life, feel better, and also have improvement in myocardial function. But the beta blocker can't do all the work here. You know, uh, so many patients are sent to clinic and they're just on a beta blocker for concerns of, you know, renal dysfunction or low blood pressure and things like that. And we need to be very, very careful that if we are excluding these medications, it's for the right reason. 
And if we look at our uh, heart failure registries, um, and the CHAMP heart failure registry really um, beautifully described this, uh, very few of our patients are receiving appropriate therapies and at the right dose. So not only are we not offering patients therapies, we're, we're underdosing them. Even in the trial setting, in the CONNECT heart failure trial, uh, this is a clinical trial setting. We are not making changes post-hospitalization and we are not optimizing dose. So what else can we do? Well, we know there are many life-saving therapies for heart failure. Uh, we've talked about uh, cardiomems yesterday, and I'm sure you know we've talked a lot about you know clips and um, and device-based therapies, and of course our LVAD. Uh, but if you look at these data that I've accumulated from various registries and studies, um, really less than 25%, in some cases less than 5% of our heart failure patients who are eligible are being offered life-saving therapies. And I think this is because as heart failure progresses, management becomes so incredibly complex. You know, here you have 15 page minutes to spend with the patient, uh, and, and you're supposed to talk to them about an AFib ablation and, you know, their lifestyle and assess their mitral regurgitation. Is it better? Are they diuresed appropriately? All these new medicines. Um, do they have advanced heart failure? It just, it's a lot, and it becomes very complex. But we don't want to miss these patients who do have advanced heart failure. And trying to figure out when this golden window is can be very confusing. We don't want to refer patients too early and do unnecessary testing. But we also don't want to miss it um, and, and not be able to offer our patients the chance at a longer life with transplant or LVAD. So there are some clinical clues. Um, and the you know, most obvious is obviously um, need for IV diuretics or uh, hospitalizations for heart failure. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, but what I propose is should a heart failure hospitalization trigger an assessment of hemodynamics? Um, and then our imaging studies, you know, uh, many patients will come to my clinic and they'll have had three echoes in the past year, you know, assessing their ejection fraction which is helpful and that is a marker of uh, worsening heart failure, uh, but it doesn't substitute for a hemodynamic assessment. And we can actually do um, a pretty good job assessing hemodynamics um, non-invasively with our echo imaging uh, if somebody will report it. And what about invasive hemodynamic assessment? How do we make this as routine as a stress test? You know, nobody comes in the hospital and says they have chest pain and doesn't get a stress test, right? Um, just in case, we wouldn't want to miss it. Um, you know, what about our heart failure patients? How do we make sure we are not missing advanced heart failure? Well, I just want to kind of harp on this a little bit. Heart failure hospitalizations are the number one sign, symptom, you know, biomarker, anything you can look at, the number one thing associated with mortality. And if you look at um, this, these data, uh, a third and fourth hospitalization, um, that's, that's pretty dim and dire, you know, less than six months to live. That's worse than ALS or stage four lung cancer. And still these people are being admitted to the hospital, told not to eat chips or pizza and sent home, <laughs> right? Um, you know, this is, this is no longer a, a self-care issue. Um, you know, they have advanced heart failure. So I just want to spend the last two minutes talking about what we've done at Piedmont to help to elevate the moment. Um, one thing I think is, is really, really helpful to capture these folks in the hospital um, is a heart failure unit. And we've piloted this at one of our hospitals in Athens. Um, this unit is separate from the cardiology floor or the CCU. Um, it's a dedicated unit. It's designed after an integrated practice unit model, which is used uh, for stroke. And the staff provide extensive patient education. Um, they know how to aggressively diurese. They you know, know how to meet all these metrics that are important for heart failure, like ins and outs, et cetera. They can monitor cardiomems. Um, and the key to success is the heart failure navigator, a nurse who navigates appropriate patients onto the unit and inappropriate patients off the unit. Um, there's bedside multidisciplinary rounds connecting with case management, uh, social workers, you know, et cetera. And the real goal of this is to engage the patient and their support system to ensure success. Um, and I know our administrators in the room understand that the goal of these boxes is turned to red boxes green. <laughs> and you can see that we've done that um, with overwhelming success. 
Um, and for any you know heart failure folks that are in the room, how does this impact a transplant program? Well, capturing these high-risk patients um, and being able to identify them, assess their hemodynamics in a timely way, and refer them um, has been extremely successful for our heart failure program. We're also working to educate our providers with videos to try to um, get everybody up to date on GDMT and heart failure uh, with three heart failure videos. We're also working to teach our patients with updated um, data that we can give them and brochures, the staff with protocols, making referring um, to our heart failure centers even easier, and also trying to um, treat patients where we are. So we're, our goal is to increase patient access to expert heart failure care in the community, um, increase shared care centers for transplant and LVAD, and treat patients where they are. I think this is so important. And that's it. That's all I have. Thank you.